and then composition, and then story writing, and then manifesto. It is not by force that you write a letter, you write the two types of letters, and then you go and write stories, and go and write manifesto, no. Composition is composition. So you will choose one, okay? And you choose one for, we'll give you options. That is what it is. We give you options. You choose the one you are comfortable with. But after comprehension is composed, everybody's going to answer it. Simple story, simple test. You read it. We learned all the techniques of reading, comprehension, answering questions. So even if the story is a different one, it's a new story, you can still read and understand. And then find synonyms and antonyms of some words. So there is no cost for alarm. It's a very cheap paper. And I'm sure everybody will pass. Amen. Amen. So today we are going to, last week, we discussed comprehension enough, extensively. So we don't want to go back to comprehension. We talk about composition to letter writing. We mentioned the two types of letters. We identify the formats and the features of these two types of letters. So I'm sure if you have to write a letter um, to any public official, you know the kind of letter you are writing. And if you are writing to your niece, your, your friend somewhere to, you know the kind of letter you're writing and the language to be used. Today we are going to look at story writing and then manifesto writing. How do you write a good story? What are some of the features or components of a good story, writing a story? Sometimes you are asked to write a story that starts with or ends with but when they say the thing starts with, some people will bring it at the tail end of the story. So we are going to discuss all that and we look at the features of story writing. Today is actually somebody's birthday in the class. So after the lesson, we are going to celebrate. I'm sure she has brought cake and some champagne and some chewables in addition. Okay, so what is a story? What goes into story writing? If you are writing a story, there are some things that you have to consider. So we say story writing refers to the method of writing in which the writer narrates a series of events that has led to a problem, the progression of the same and the end result that has led to the current situation of the characters in the story. A story can be about a real or fictional incident, including real life or imaginary characters. Now, we, have, we hear about some stories that are true stories, isn't it? And then some to the deceivers, they just narrate to make you feel happy especially when your younger ones or well, your kids are worrying you, bedtime story. Africa, we don't have so much information on that. When it's uh, evening time, you don't even say good night. Before you realize they are already dozing, they, they are off. When you go to the other side of the world, you must tell them a bedtime story before they sleep. So if you don't have any story in mind, you just have to quickly create one and they believe it. Whatever you say, they will be laughing, they will be believe it, and they enjoy it. So now, after by the end of this lesson, you should be able to create your own imaginary story, a good one, with all the features that we should have in a story. Okay. So, uh, which character do you normally hear in stories? Come on. Okay. Now, every story is expected to have the five components, namely class. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to look at these five 
components of story writing. The first one is what? Characters. When we say characters, let's discuss it briefly before we go to the explanation. When we say a character, the characters in the story, blah, blah, blah. So someone should explain when they say a character of a story, who is the character of a story? The character of the story are the people who are acting in the story. Means when the writer is writing, the people he use as the person are the characters. For him. So the people in the story are your characters, isn't it? Okay. So what about the setting? The setting, yes. Can you just speak up so? Can you hear her? No. The what? The time. The time. I'm saying that it's, a, it's the time and the location of a story. That's my definition. Okay. You have tried. It's a good attempt. Any other? Setting. Try it. Um, okay. A certain, I think it's the place where the the story is being set up. Where does it set? It's where the story is taking place, isn't it? Okay. So when we talk about the setting, we are talking about the location of the story. I mentioned in the video that uh, when we come to Unimark IFT. There is a program called production design. And these designers are wonder makers. If you want a hospital scene, they will construct everything for you. Anything you have to see in a hospital scene, you'll get it there. If you need a forest, so when you come around IFT, they have decided to cut all the trees. Eh? They can create a forest in the studio. Have you seen it before? Yeah. How many of you have been to IFT before? Okay, you did a certificate or diploma program. Oh, okay. In what? TV production. Okay. And you, the gentleman who said he's been there before. In which program? You. Oh, okay. And then you? Say again. And television techniques, you two, the same program. Okay, so production design, they do makeup and they do costume. So you see the characters, how they look like. If you want them to have a cat, a big cat, or have a wind, you know, the gogomi coming from the, the store, they can create it for you. They are wonder makers. That's how I call them. If you want somebody to be swollen, they will paint you and dress you in a way that when they see you, they know that this person is actually sick. So the setting can be anywhere. It can even be in a room like this. It can either be in the forest. So sometimes you have, you can move out to other locations for the setting, or you can still use your own space for the setting. You can even create a river. And sometimes if you want rainfall, you know it is possible to do that. So we do all that. Then the plot. What about the plot? A plot of a story. The way you are dull this morning, have you eaten? Eh? Have you eaten? Or you want to do a little bit of jogging? Okay, so let's be active. Otherwise, you all stand when you answer a question, then you sit down. Okay, so let's move on to... In addition to this, a story has a point of view in which it is narrated or portrayed in a style in which it is written. That is why in the video I said, if you are narrating a very sad story, will you be smiling? Uh -huh. Or a very nice, beautiful comedy story that makes people laugh and then you'll be crying. Is it possible? So you narrate the story or you write it, you know, uh, in the style that is portrayed, uh, how it is 
actually written, narrated or portrayed in the style in which it is written. Now let's look at each of the components, the characters, the characters. No story is complete without a character. Is it possible to have a story without a character? No. Every story will either revolve around multiple Okay, every story will either revolve around multiple characters or just one character. Sometimes you have some short videos, it's only one person or two people. Some two you can have as many as 50, 10, 20, and so forth and so on. Having strong characters of all types makes your story unique, isn't it? You have the, the dramatic ones and eh? those that can cry within, what, you snap your finger, you realize they started crying. In the Nigerian movies, who do you know that this one here? Yeah, she's good at who? Hilda. Uh -huh. And who else? And who? Destiny And who else? And who makes you laugh? The, the films that you watch. They have, we have some characters that will make you laugh. Who? Mr. Ibu. And who again? Patience as well. And who again? So Ghana, there you don't know anybody. Hey, you are all mentioning Nigerian things, characters. What about Ghana? Ejabo Bagbenchis. Eh? Mr. Beautiful. And who again? Say again. Acrobato. Aha. Uh -huh. So these are characters. You have, you know, the serious ones, isn't it? If you pair somebody like John Dumelo and then uh, Ejapo, you know the kind of trend your story will take. So at a point you get serious, and at a point you what? You laugh because you have two different characters on your set. Okay. So the setting, the term setting refers to the physical surrounding in which the story takes place. The whereabouts of the characters, <clears throat> the characters might also contribute to the setting of the story. The setting of a story can be a forest, a house, a street, space, or outer universe. So it can be the air, a small island, a train, or even someone's mind. That is the imaginary one. You say the story, you imagine it, you tell it. It's you yourself, you know the location in your mind. It is up to the writer to include all the details that they think they would, that they think will make the story more colorful. Sometimes we spice the story in a way that it will become overspiced, isn't it? And you highlight on one character and the character traits and all that. So now let's look at the plot of a story. Many of us are acquainted with the term plot, but what does the term mean? In simple terms, the plot of a story refers to what goes on in a story or what the story is about. A plot includes various causes of events or action. Sometimes you wonder why this person behaved this way. Eh? That is, a, or you are waiting to see, okay, this person has done this. What would be the next? action or the consequences of what this person has done. A plot includes various causes of event, actions, climatic point, and resolutions. After all, a well-woven plot is what will help you form a good and a, a, a strong story. Then we go to the theme. When we talk about a theme of a story, what is it about? Is the idea or subject that pervades the whole story, what the story is about, the main idea of the story. It is different from the plot. The plot, you are predicting what is happening, what is going to happen next. This person has done this, so what will happen next, okay? Huh. But the theme, what the whole story is about. Is it about, uh, let's say, um, child abuse? Is it about a love story? Is it about uh, a sick person? So that is the theme. 
of the story. This is the concept on which the whole story revolves. Example of things can be family relationship, music, love, and romance, war, rebellion, etc. For instance, the theme of the animated film, Koku, have you watched that film before? Mm, you haven't? Okay. So uh, those who enroll at IFT, you watch a lot of movies, animation movies of fiction, any kind of documentary movies, and you'll be able to do a lot of them. When somebody mentioned this, we say, oh, I've watched it two years ago, three years ago. Okay. All right. So the theme, animated theme, Coco, is love for music and the importance of family. And the theme of the animated films, Brave, or A Brave and Mona, is breaking out of social norms and following your hearts. Are we good with the explanation of theme of a story? Are we okay? So the next one is conflict. When we say conflict, what comes into your mind? Yes, and one person just put up your hand and tell us when you hear the word conflict. Yes, yes. Misunderstanding or a fight somewhere. Yes. The what? Opposite of okay. Yes. Any other yes? Disagreement. Okay. It means that there's no peace somewhere, a particular place, there's no peace. Or in the story, something happened that will lead to something misunderstanding, isn't it? So the conflict term refers to problem in the story. Conflict is problematic, isn't it? Wherever there is conflict, there is no peace, isn't it? So when all is going all well, you are enjoying your story, the film, then suddenly something bad happens. Especially if it's your hero in the story that you are believing this one, oh my God, and suddenly somebody shoots the, the hero in the story. Will you feel happy? Uh -huh. When all is going on well, and the, there is one point in the story when the main characters come across an obstacle that impedes their journey to achieve a set goal. The conflict is what gets the protagonist. You know protagonist? Did you say yes or no? Yes. That is your assignment. If you don't know it, go and find out. To move out of their comfort zone to face their antagonist. Act bravely to solve the problem and find ways to attain their goals. Basically, every story should have the beginning, middle, and then the end. That is the format of a story. A story must have a beginning. If it doesn't have a beginning, how are you going to start in the first place? So a story must have a beginning, the middle, and then you must end the story to make it complete. So what goes into the beginning of a story? Just like every other piece of writing, the beginning of the story is what will determine if the reader will want to continue reading or not. So it is very crucial to have a rather right, writing start. You have, you've got to keep the, the readers hooked from the first moment itself. So, like I said, sometimes you take some storybooks, when you start reading the story, it even puts you off, you put the book down and you sleep, isn't it? But some to the first line, the first paragraph that you read, you are interested in the story, you want to know more, you want to read more, and, and even themes that you watch, you realize that when you start, some are so, if everybody is asleep, you alone, you'll be awake. You want to watch that film to the end. Is it not true? Okay. So this is what happened. So how you begin your story? Okay. So as I was saying, 
the beginning of everything is very important because that is what will sustain the audience interest if you are acting a play and then they come, they sit down. You start your presentation or your, your play and it's not interesting. By the time you get to the middle, only three people will remain in the auditorium, isn't it? Everybody will be, fed. it will be boring. Say, ah, what kind of play is this? Then you get up, then you leave. So the beginning of your story must be interesting. Even if the examiner is marking your story, oh, this is a beautiful story. He may even forget your errors, grammatical errors, because it's a beautiful story. So the old age, um, the old, the age old and most common way to start a story is with the use of phrases like a long time ago. But what were we taught? Once upon a time. Once upon a time. Uh -huh. Then you continue the story. Others also have uh, their various ways of starting a story. You must have seen it being used in many children's stories. However, this need not always be the case. You can start the story directly with the character introduction, the portrayal of the setting, or even an action. For example, let's we are learning about sound. Let's say theme sound production or yeah music sound music video sound and all those things so i can come to the class and i'll be talking under the i'm not using the mic i'm talking like those at the back like if i want you to pay attention so i'll start talking under the one of the time those at the back will be like it means i'm going to talk about sound and i'll ask Go to hear me, then you say what? No. So it means you are talking about the importance of sound in films, music, or videos. Is that okay? So you can introduce your story like that. You have the concept, talk about something that is related to your story. So you don't need to start by saying once upon a time or a long time ago. So what goes into the middle of a story? What goes into the middle of the story? That is where the real action takes place, isn't it? Okay, then beginning the story on a wonderful note and letting it drag later will not help the story in any way. You have to keep the story going, maintain the suspense in the story, make use of language cleverly, use literary devices, and even the smallest detail, if you think it will drive the story. So the middle is also what very important. You started well, they are interested, they are enjoying it. The, the middle should not go down. You have to maintain that standard. Using descriptive language can further help to a great extent as it will give your audience a visual representation of everything that is going on in the story. You see that they start imagining things, okay? the middle. So sustainability of your story writing or telling is very, very important. How do you end a story? How do we end stories? The films that you watch, the storybooks that you read, how do they end them? Do they just say, let's say, and John went to the river side and then you end it there. Is that a good ending of a story? No, you have to end it well so that the people who listen to it or read it will have a moral lesson about what you are trying to inform them. A good story writer knows when to drop the curtains for the readers. Do you know that this is an idiomatic expression? Do you know to drop the curtains for the readers? It means what? If you know, you just put up your hand. It means what? Draw a curtain on something. It means what? Yes. To end the story, to bring it to an end. So when you are reading, be looking out for the things that we have discussed in class. Similarly, if you want them to write a good story, you must know when to wrap up, wrap it up. It's another idiomatic expression, isn't it? You must have seen an open ending in many writings. 
That is also an option you can choose. Sometimes we leave you to decide the end of the story. Remember that you need not always provide a very pleasant ending or the ending that your audience might expect. Don't always please the audience. Sometimes if they need to cry, if it's a sad story, let them know this is a sad story. If they need to cry, allow them to cry. If they need to laugh, allow them. Don't always have a perfect story. And at the end of the day, they live happily ever after. The story should not always be like that, okay? It should be something that will keep them in suspense. So they, even if they uh, imagine the end, that's not actually what the case will be in the story. So sometimes don't let your readers end the story for you. Like they can predict the end. Just like we see in some of these Nigerian and Ghanaian films, you know the end, obviously, from the beginning. Uh -huh. The only, okay, you are free to end the story according to your discretion. You are narrating the story. So you end it according to your discretion. The only thing you will have to bear in mind is to give the story the ending it deserves. Sometimes you watch some beautiful stories or you read them, but the end, it doesn't really relate to, you know, what they want you to get from the story. So it means that that story wasn't properly written. Okay, so we have a sample of a story. We'll read it and then we'll look at a few things. We try to identify the, the characters in the story. We identify the set, the plot, and then what else? The theme and the conflict. So it is not always that you find conflict in stories. Sometimes they are there, and other times they are not there. Okay. So I have a question. Um, so let's look at that uh, in the exams we are asked to. In the exams we are asked to write or outline the for, uh, the format of a story. And then we know that the format of a story, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Now, listen carefully. The format is different from the feature. Yeah. And the features of the story. But the format is different from the beginning, the middle, and the end. And the features are what? The, the characters, the settings, the, the plots, the, the team, and the, the comfort. Form. So in this case, the format, the, the beginning, the, the middle, and the end. Can I also say that the introduction, the main body, the thesis, or the conclusion? No, I'm just asking, in case perhaps I've forgotten, but I know that in everything, the introduction, you must have a main body, and you must have a conclusion. Very simple. So, otherwise, maybe in the process of explaining your point, you may deviate. So, you know that every story has a beginning, the middle part and then the end, very simple, okay? All right, any other question? Because you came late, is it not in the video? Have you watched the video? You haven't, it means you have not even done the way. So this one, I'm scoring everybody on it. The last assignment, why would I give an assignment if I know I will not use it? And the deadline has passed, isn't it? Oh. It hasn't. Tomorrow. Yes. Ah, why will I do that? <laughs> so I'll not talk about the teachers and the format again. So going to the story straight. I want one person, a volunteer, to just get up and read the story for us. A volunteer. The perfect trick. Walking through the forest, I came across a little bird that.
Hello. Walking through the forest, I came across a little bird that enjoyed flying from one tree to another. It seems to be looking for something. I stood there observing it. I wished to help it, but I did not know what it was looking for. I did not want to scare it away or disturb it either. Finally, it perched to pick up a particular twig. I followed it to see where it was headed to, and I found it war. And I found it on one of the most beautiful, beautifully blossomed trees. It was the last thing that required to complete the nest, and it fit perfectly well. Seeing this, I walked away happily, thinking to myself, how many people shoo away, shoo away birds as soon as they catch sight of them. And I was just glad I didn't do it. Because if I did, the bird would not have found that perfect trick. The perfect twig. Walking through the forest, I came across a little bird that enjoyed flying from one tree to another. It seemed to be enjoyed fly. It seemed to be looking for something. I stood there observing it. I wished to help it, but I did not know what it was looking for. I did not want to scare it away or disturb it either. Finally, it pecked to pick up a particular Y-shaped twig. I followed it to see where it was headed to. And I found it on one of the most beautifully blossomed trees. It was the last thing that was required to complete the nest and it fit perfectly well. In this, I walked away happily, thinking to myself how many people shoo away birds as soon as they catch sight of them. And I was just glad I didn't do it, because if I did, the bird would not have found that perfect twig. And I read for to read it the way it is, so that people would enjoy it. In who has been telling stories, Kukwanasi uh, stories on TV, GTV or something, by the fireside or something. Mami Dokuno. And you see the way she narrates the story. And everybody's what? Enjoying, or they'll be enjoying the story because of the spices that have been what? Added to it. I don't need ginger and garlic, please. Okay, so do you like the story? It's a very beautiful story. So those of you who see birds, the moment you see them, you have to shoot them away. Hey, or you take a stone and then you throw it at them. Sometimes they are looking for something. It might even be food. And then you decided to scare it away. So what have you achieved? Will you give food to the bear? No. Okay. Madam, this is uh, something small to pass through it. Judging between the first reader in the class and then the second reader, it tells us that there could be good storytellers who are different from good story writers. Is that right? Sometimes you can write the story perfectly well, but if you don't have a good reader to read it for you, the beautiful idea that is in, or the lesson that is in the story for you to learn, you'll miss it. And sometimes too, the story can be that kind of story, but the person reading it or narrating it can add what spices, other things to it to make it what a beautiful story. Some people are gifted and some also are trained, okay? Some are trained. You see those journalists, eh? the broadcast journalists, like uh, when you come to uh, Institute of Journalism, they have broadcast, uh, they have journalism. And then IFT has broadcast journalism. 
And then you see this newscasters, they, they put the, they are writing at behind the teleprompter, then they'll be reading it with their beautiful voices and the English, you know, the phonetics. And then you now, you know that these people to the deal. <laughs> you know that even though you went to Achimota school, the best school, and someone is from a village school, the person is trained. Sometimes it's a gift. Other times so they train you to read or speak like that. You have to train yourself, okay? So after this English class, I need a change in your, your writing. And, and when I see you one day somewhere in a big car, in a big company, the kind of English you, you speak, I'll be like, wow. So did you like the story? Who are the characters in the story? Who are the characters of the story? If you don't, just put up your hand. The bed and the narrator. It's all right. So if it is an audio something that you hear, you say the narrator. But this one we see the writer. Are we good? Okay. If it is something that we are hearing in audio form, then you say the narrator. Okay. What is the setting of the story? What is the setting of the story? Mm -hmm. Do you want to try? The setting. Oh, yes. The story takes place. It took place in the forest, isn't it? Yes. And we discussed that the setting of a story is where the story what takes place. So in this case, we talk about birds, and we know obviously they are about this way. The forest. Okay, so what is the plot? We discuss plot. What is the plot of the story? So we have about three, four plots, right from the narrator seeing the bed and wondering why the bed was there. That's one plot. And that led to the narrator following the bed to where the bed was fixing the... Okay. the so an action took place. That prompted the narrator, no, where is this bed taking this to it to? So that is why he or she followed the bear to see where it was going, isn't it? All right. So what is the theme of the story? My black piece. Okay. It's just there. Is it not there? That is just the title of the story. So it's what? The perfect twin. Okay. Is there any conflict in this story? Are you sure? Is there any conflict in the story? Any problem? What do you think would have been the conflict in the story? If there should be one, what do you think would have been? Man had went to shoot the bed. To shoot the bed away, it means the bed will not find that perfect week. So the word conflict. It means the nest is not what complete for the bed to go and sleep inside. Yes. I also saw in the story that the bed has to um, move from one tree to the other to find the perfect week. Is that not a conflict? The conflict is that if the narrator were to shoot the bed away, it means. The bird will miss that opportunity to finding the perfect way to complete its nest. Do you understand? But because it didn't happen, the narrator says, I did not shoot it away. So it means the bird is able to what, complete its mission. So the story, there is no conflict in it. You enjoy the story? Okay. I think there's another one.
I know you can think of other stories that contains these characters, the setting, the plot, the theme, and then conflict. So next time you are watching a movie or reading any book, make sure you look out for these pictures of the story. Is that okay? All right. So the next one, we move to writing manifestos. I mentioned that when we first met, it was in the seminar room, and then every gathering, we need somebody who will lead us, isn't it? So we decided that we're going to nominate people to become class reps. What was the procedure that we used? What was the procedure that we used to elect our class reps? Elected an ESO official, and we did the voting. But first, the people that we selected had to tell us what they would do if we selected them as our class reps. Okay, so, uh, so those who were behaving as if they were not there at the orientation, I'm sure during your SHS days and or vocational institution, whatever you have attended, you've been to school, when they are nominating class prefect, I don't know how it is done. But do they just mention that name? You are the class prefect. You are the assistant. Is that what is done? Even the school prefect position, what do they do? The very 21st too. What do they do? They first elected the people and then they give us their manifestos. So they nominate the people, isn't it? So the class can nominate somebody or the teacher can say, this, this, you, 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 and then you come and what? Compete. Is it not a competition? So you know what goes on or when people write manifestos? You know when people write manifestos? Tell me one. Um, they tell us what they, they will do. When do people write manifestos? When? When they are applying for a position. Yeah, bank manager, you write a manifesto. No. The political arena. The political arena when they are applying for position. When they are applying for positions in a particular setting, isn't it? It can be in a school, it can be where? The country? It can be where? So this is when we write manifestos. Very soon, the manifestos of the various political parties will be out. And then write a very big book. This is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. But at the end of their term, you take the book and then this one, check. This one, check. If you are able to mark all those things that they have actually done then, then it means the person is what? A good leader. It's the type that will say and do. Eh? But some too, they come and tell us, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then at the end of the antenna, you take the manifesto and look at what they promise. This one, zero. Next one, zero. So that person would have been a bad leader or a liar. A liar boy or a liar girl. So since we have a basic idea about writing manifestos, let's look at what goes into writing a manifesto. Manifesto is a written statement outlining what a person or a group of people stands for and how they plan to effect change. This document put for personal beliefs in the attempt to persuade others. So they persuade you to buy into their ideas. This is what I want to do for you. So you vote for me. It's up to you to believe. They persuade you. And persuasion is different from force. Somebody, they persuade, they convince you. Eh? 
then you look at it and then you say, ah, I will vote for this person. Okay, it's for this reason you might hear the word creed or mission statement or manifesto. So they are synonyms of what? A manifesto. So another name for manifesto is what? A creed or mission statement. In any case, this document serves as valuable assessment tools. People can look back on them to see how well their practical attempts to change things for the better align with their initial goals. That's why I say at the end of the, your turn, if it is four years, now we are going to look at all the promises that you have made. I'm sure if I say mention the promises that the NDC government made those times, you'll be able to remember them. And if I say mention the ones that MPP government may also stated, you'll be able to remember them. Now, at the end of everybody's tenor, eh? Then you remember, you remind them of their words. You say you will do this for us. Have we done it? Yes or no? Uh -huh. So this creed or manifestos are used to what? Assess people's performance and to find out if they actually align with what they promised to do. Okay? Do you understand? Okay. So now let's, we are going to look at how to write a good manifesto. The steps involved in writing a manifesto. You don't just get up and write anything and present. I'm sure you get the zero put ever quickly. So you have to follow a particular steps in what? Writing a manifesto. Some of you, I'm sure in future, when you get to level 300, God willing, if that is if you pass the exams, or if you want to pass the exams, when you get to level 300 or level 400, you'll be vying for the position of what? SRC president. Then from SRC president, your interest, your appetite to become so big that you want to be the assembly member, uh, assembly man or assembly woman. Then before you realize, you become a party secretary. Before you realize, uh, what's your name? You. James will be in the news, eh? vying for the position of an MP in a particular, uh -huh. then all of you. Then I see the face, say, hey, look at this one. What's your name? I say, Spa Isaac. It's not the MP. Wow. Eh? And that will be good news. OK. So please uh, follow this discussion so that your manifesto that you'll be writing in the future will be a good one. Your manifesto should be a brief, snappy set of principles and calls to action rather than an abridged and exhaustive report of every reason you believe what you do. Be brief. When you talk too much, you miss your point. You know that. Be brief. Don't come and talk plenty. I will do this, and if you vote for me, this is what I will do, and I will start by doing this, and I will go there. No. To get a call for what? Action. It means you are involving people to work together collectively to achieve something. If you stand there and you are saying, I, I will do it, I, I, I will do that. That is when, when your time is over, then we ask you, do you, 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 you too. We too will say you, you. Eh? So don't talk too much. Unnecessary points to make your manifesto clumsy, okay? Choose a manifesto from a historical personage, personage you admire, somebody who has achieved something. Eh? A lot of people write about Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, how he was what, you know, he persevered to achieve so many things despite all the troubles along the way he did this. Some people also say, well, mention some world leaders that you can think of as good leaders because they always say what they do. They always do what they say, sorry. <laughs> Even Nelson Mandela, people like Mandela, isn't it? And who else? I can talk about Fifi at a meal. Fifi at a meal. Okay, you look like him though. <laughs> yes, any other great leader you know that this person Martin Luther King. Yeah. Any other? Right. 
Manado. Wow. Yeah, any other? Any other great leader? George Bush. George Bush. George Bush. Yes, any other? Um, Julius Nyerere. Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. Yes. Gaddafi. Yes. Selassie. Thomas Sakara. Hitler. Okay, so if I let's narrow ourselves to Ghana, we are talking about mainly Ghana. This is our country. So let's talk about some great leaders. Yes, my sister. Yes, Santua. Yes. Jerry John Rawlings. Yes. That's President Pufuo. Yes. I come for not yes. Blue, yeah. Kwame Nkrumah, yes. Otunfo, yes. Abedi Pele, was he a leader? A football leader. <laughs> but he is, he is justifying it that Abedi Pele was a football leader. Captain. Yes, it's just like somebody who was going to, you know, Nigeria, before you marry somebody's daughter, they want to know who your father is and your family history. This gentleman dressed in suit, went to see the uh, in-law, father-in-law to be, and then the father-in-law said, you look good. He said, thank you, sir. What do you do? He said, he's a businessman. He said, what do you do? In what business? He said, oh, I buy goat, sheep, cow, and then, then the man said, are you into export and import? He said, no. Then the man said, in short, you are a butcher. <laughs> so someone says, he's a what? A football leader. So in short, it's what? A captain. All right. Any other leader that you realize this person, he will say it and do it pe -pe -pe. I leave that one to you to decide. <laughs> Okay, so consider election manifesto or political party platforms, for instance. These documents are often heavier on slogans. You know their slogans? Give us a CPP slogan. CPP. You don't know. So the common one you know is MPP NDC. Okay, give us MPP so. No, that can never be a slogan of a manifesto. Eh? The slogan of a manifesto is what? Form of banana. Is it form of banana? What was it? No. Yes, we are talking about manifestos. Yes, so they have slogans for their manifestos. Yes, so yes. And then free SHS is one of them, isn't it? That's the slogan. And then what else? One district. Pretty day it is not a slogan. <laughs> okay, so what's of the NDC? They also have their slogan. Is what? Wow, 24 hour economy. Is that part of their manifesto? Is this in their manifesto? Are their manifestos out? So we are talking about the previous ones. The previous ones. For now, I don't think any of them have released their manifestos. So we are dwelling on the previous one that they have. Better Ghana agenda. Mm. Was that not Atamil's uh, slogan? Anyway. All right. So we say they are often heavier on slogans than they are on substance because they say a lot of things that they will do and then in reality, most of them do not even exist. 
Okay. Those okay. documents are often heavy. Okay. They briefly state a party's principles in the interest of inspiring change. In this case, persuading people to vote for them or for the party. I told you persuading is not forcing somebody. You convince somebody. Eh? The way you present your case, the person will suddenly develop interest in what? Voting for you or your party. Then we also look at the next step is what? Catch the reader's interest. What do we mean by that? Throughout the writing process, do your best to make your manifesto as engaging as what possible. If you are not making any sense, we cannot even align, you know, our vision or with whatever you are saying, what we are expecting, our expectation with your vision. It's like you are not communicating, isn't it? So it should be something that we all understand and be what interested in. So we have to use languages and interesting analogies you are able to derive from your own experiences. If you need a stronger word for something you are trying to say, make use of an alternative word, or in other words, make use of synonyms, and antonyms. Don't be repeating the same word. We talk about synonyms and antonyms, and I'm sure when you are writing your manifesto, you will not use one word more than 10 times or five times. Every line contains that word. No. So you use alternative words. Contemplate and then decide on the one you think drives home your point the best. So you have to be choosy when it comes to words. One, don't go and use big grammar that will confuse people instead of confusing them. Then the third step is what? To choose your audience. Always remember who you are or who your audience are. If you are communicating to a class one child, the language that you use will be different from when you are communicating. Uh, uh, maybe your audience is the university student. Let's say you, for instance. Hey, Mr. Roland, you are here. We have a new class, class teacher. <laughs> so your audience for class one is different from your audience for university, isn't it? Because the language that you use will have an effect on what you are communicating, the point you are trying to make. So be mindful of the language you use, the content, the promises, because it will not make sense to a class one child when you are using big, 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 heavy grammar, heavy duty words, because you want to show that you are a scholar. You just completed University of Media Arts and Communication, so you are going to use big grammar. You end up confusing everybody. Well, let's say you are going to stand for an assembly member in your village, isn't it? Those people, they like the word, the local language. Say the thing tree or ewe or awusa or gan so that the people will understand what you are trying to say. But if you are there and you are using English because you are from Accra, start counting your wood. <laughs> then the fourth step is what decide on core value. Sometimes you have to prioritize the things you want to do. Which one is more important? Which one is more needed immediately? So I want someone to read what is there. Because the screen is off, somebody from this side, this group, should read what is on the board for us. Brainstorm some main points you hope to get to your mind. Brainstorm some main points you hope to get across in your manifesto. We can even write these as simple bullet points at first before revising them into more eloquent verbiage. Every manifesto should have a simple principle or set principles to export. Okay. Can I say resort class 10? Yeah. So, 
So, if you know you are tall, please spare your hands from the fan. Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Hands up. Open. Close. Oh, I didn't say clap. Open. Close. Uh -huh. Open. Close. Hands back. Forward. Sideways. Open up. Open up. Hands down. And hold your waist. And hold your waist. So let's go. Let's go clockwise and then anti-clockwise. So, okay, so we are going to recite one rhyme, then we sit down. So, lead us in the rhyme. <laughs> row, row, row your boat gently. Okay, a a lion. Yes. Okay, so ready. Go. A lion. A lion. A lion has a tail. It has a big head and a very small waist. And a very small waist. So. Hello. So the core values, you are saying what? You put them in what? Bullet points. For example, if you are talking to them about um, writing a story, we know the, the components and then we know the, is it the format? We know the format and then we know the features of the story. So we just list them down. For example, the characters, the setting, the theme, the conflict, and then the plot. So before you are not going to what explain into detail, okay? So you don't miss your point. So you have to what? List them and then you follow, explain it to your audience accordingly. Then point number five, map out a plan of action. The things you have listed in your manifesto, how are you going to achieve them? So a gentleman will read for us what that means. And I'm walking towards somebody. Map out a plan of action. Your manifesto needs to be featured a call to action rather than just a set of briefs. As its issuer, you must hope to pursue your audience to make changes because of your argument provide people with guidelines as to how they can bring about the change in the change you seek. That well, clap for him. So your manifesto needs to feature a call to action rather than just a set of beliefs. It is as its issuer, you must hope to persuade the audience to make changes because of your arguments. Provide people with guidelines as to how they can bring about the changes you seek. Now, we are talking about class prefect or class prefect. And I'm standing here telling you, and uh, there will be discipline, there will be order here. How do I ensure that? How do I engage you to ensure order in the school? So, I have to involve you. You must come to school on time. You must do all your assignments. Some people are owing assignments in this mature student class. Some people are owing assignments. You are about 143. That is what I see on the page. But basically, averagely, it is only about 90 something or 80 something that answers questions when assignments are given. So the rest, how are you ensuring that you are going to pass this exam? Because assignment alone takes a percentage of the total mark. And since you have started absenting or dodging assignments, I'm wondering how you are going to save yourself anyway. 
So you stand before the class, you say you are going to buy them a school bus. Is it about saying it? So what effort? What are the plans? What, uh, what you know, how are you going to achieve that? Are you going to work with the school management or you are going to solicit for sponsorship outside? You have to indicate all that in the manifesto to persuade your audience to do what? To vote for you because we know that if you go to Guinness, Ghana, they may give you something. If you go to Vortec, you go to uh, Despite Media Group, they give you some money. So if you are able to convince us how you are going to ensure this and this and that are done, then we will be convinced enough to what? To elect you or vote for you as our class rep. Any question? So the next step, the final step, when you have finished writing your manifesto, what do you do? In exams, when you finish writing or doing your work, what do you do? You go through. Why do you think it is important to revise your work before submitting it? It ensures you correct your mistakes. Okay, any other point? Okay, so there are some I's that you did not dot and some T's that you did not cross. So you go through it and sometimes so we give our manifestos to our peers or somebody you know has an expertise in English eh? that's okay, check my grammar for me. Is it okay? Eh? Or is it too big so that I break, I break it down? So you can give it to somebody to proofread. Maybe you might have jumped some of the sentences, the words. Instead of a present tense or future tense, you are using past tense. Somebody can go through and identify those mistakes and then what? Correct them for you. If you are in a hurry and you submit it like that or you present it, you go and embarrass yourself in front of everybody. So proofreading is essential. It's as essential to writing a manifesto as it is to any other form of essay. Or uh, you should rework your first rough draft at least a few times. So sometimes you write the first draft, you make correction. The correction becomes what? The second draft. Another correction takes place. Then you, people can write as fast uh, as much as five times or so before you arrive at the final manifesto. So now we know the systems of writing manifesto, isn't it? All right. It's only those who have not watched the video that to say they have no idea. Now we are looking at content and structure of a manifesto. You should ensure that the actual content of your manifesto is what? Smart. And then we break it down. The S is what? Be specific. What do you want to do? Just go straight to the point. If one village, one dam, say that is one village, one dam. Eh? If it is uh, one computer per child, just say it. Say what you want to do, okay? And then the aim is what? Measurable. It should be something you achieve. You are, your tenor is only two years, and you are buying the pass. Is it not bigger than your dreams? Within two years, can you achieve that? Unless you have enough money. So don't say things that will be difficult for you to what? Achieve within your time in office. Do you understand? Huh. Say again. One village, one dam. It's possible, you know. Eh? Once there is money, it's possible. Then achievable. Will you be able to accomplish it, attain that goal? You have to ensure that it is what? Achievable. Your, your promises are what? Achievable. Then they are realistic. That is the R, realistic. Can you achieve it realistically? Then time bound. You consider the time you have. And then when exactly you are looking at achieving that particular uh, promise or pledge. So we have the SMART in writing manifesto. And the SMART is what class mentioned them. Yeah. 
and you should be able to explain them. You should under, just understand them, okay? If you are writing a manifesto, you are writing a manifesto, right? Okay, so what are the things that makes your manifesto a good one? What are some of the things? Let's say you want to be the SRC president. What will make your manifesto a good one? We are looking at, you should consider the students you represent. After all, this is why you are running for election. Remember people's experiences at university can vary because of social, cultural, and other differences. So think about issues that will be common to everyone regardless of their background. You know, religion, we have how many types of religion? Yes, was it yesterday or Thursday? My son was asking me how many times, how many prayers or how many times do Muslims say their prayers? Right. And I was like, is it three or five? Because, huh. so we have different people from different ethnic background, religious, but in this class, we have Christians. How many Christians are here? How many Christians? Okay, hands down. How many Muslims are here? Yes, we have Muslims. So how many traditional believers are here? We are two. You and I, we are two. Okay, so when you are making promises, you have to consider all those people. Don't say, I'm going to build a cathedral for, for you. And this class... Eh? becomes a homogeneous one class because we have the Christians, we have the Muslim, we have the traditional people, believers in this class. And you are building, let's say, if you are building a shrine. So it means it is only a particular group of people that will benefit from the shrine, isn't it? So you have to consider That's something that all the, the students would enjoy. Are we good? If you have any question, please, you are free to ask. A good starting point is the one thing you have in common. You are all at university to get a degree and further your education. So you talk about something that is covering everybody. If it is, a, a, let's say, workshop that you want to, let's say, let's assume you are all journalism students and you want to organize workshop on journalism, best practices in journalism in Ghana. All of you benefit from it, isn't it? That is a topic for, so if you are making your promises, ensure that it's something that everybody will enjoy. You can then start thinking about a broader range of issues that affect different people. So always consider running ideas past specific groups as if group, if you are, you are unsure about something. Sometimes it is not everybody that is having a challenge in the class. And it's obvious that a particular group of people have issues. Let's say our Muslim brothers, they want to be saying their prayers. So in class, they want the lecturer to excuse them to go and say their prayers. Or the, the ladies want to wear the, is it hijab or something? Uh -huh. And then they say no. So as an SRC president, how are you going to negotiate with management to allow those people to do this? This is a peculiar situation. So even if it doesn't cover all, some should cover everybody. Only few should favor some uh, or a group of people that everybody knows that they have a major issue. Avoid making assumptions about what student different, what student different than we may need. Oh, this must be a mistake. A great way of doing this is to take part in student group meetings, okay, of what student needs or something different from one another. So you know, you get to know the problems of the student by what? Participating in their activities. When it is SRC week, you join them. If you have the intention of running to that office, running that office, you have to join them, participate in so many things. If it is games, you join the students, join your friends, and then you take part in all the activities. By communication, you get to know what their problems are. They will even tell you, you can even ask them indirectly. So are you enjoying this game? What do you think is the problem of the school? So some will begin telling you things that you know them down, 
you yourself, you even observe some. Maybe the student, they don't have uh, flexi chairs around to relax when, it is, uh, when they don't have uh, lectures and they want to sit somewhere mm, and have their group discussion. They don't have chairs or tables or a comfortable place. You have observed it yourself. So these are some of the things you say because it will favor everybody if you provide those chairs for students, isn't it? Okay. Equally be creative. A manifesto can take the shape of many formats. Be bold, yet be balanced. Don't be overconfident when you are reading your manifesto and you're doing guy guy. So I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do this. Be confident, but what? Balance. And don't let your ego carry you away. Using way too many words on your manifesto may confuse voters. Is it true? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Give me an example. If you use too many words, so people will be what? Hearing the other ones differently. So at the end of the day, you have spoken plenty and then nothing entered, isn't it? Equally be creative. A manifesto can take the shape of many formats. The bow yet balance. Okay, I think this is a repetition. So, in conclusion about writing manifestos, we say that ensure that everyone can read and understand what your aim is. Ask peers to read over your manifesto to see if the if it makes sense to them, ask, critic, ask them to critique it. Sometimes people don't like criticism. Is that not true? When you are doing something and we think this is not how it should be, your friends suggest that, oh, it should be good. Change this to this, then you get offended. Do you know better than me? Eh? Can you speak English more than me? Uh, but that's not the case. Sometimes people's opinions are very what, important and very influential on your manifesto. So be free. Even if you know what the person is saying doesn't make sense, just agree. Just agree and accept it and then include it in your work. Not all of you. You don't want to become politicians. Are you sure? Because of manifesto. Oh, in fact, you are disgracing me. Ah, because of manifesto. Manifesto is good. You are just trying to write, tell people exactly what you want to do, and then you persuade them eh, to believe in your ideas and your vision by what? Voting for you. It's as simple as that. Very soon, we'll start hearing this. They've started already. Haven't they started the campaign? Uh-huh. Not yet. Are you sure not yet? 
Eh? Just that it is not formally launched, isn't it? They start when they launch their manifestos. So during the election year, pay attention to the things that they say. Note them down. Those that are able to persuade you and you vote for them at the end of their tenure, you use their promises to what? To judge them. You say you will do this. Have you done it? And at that time, they have already looked. They say, I don't care. Eh? Yes. But manifestos can take different forms. The class rep that we selected, that we voted for, did you see them writing manifesto? So you can say whatever you even say, your submission alone, it can be verbally or orally, it can be written. Eh? So it's a manifesto. You have to say something, you don't just get it on a silver platter. You really have to work for it, isn't it? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So you should be guided by what what you say. Don't go and make empty promises that are non-existent. Things that you know you cannot do. Eh? The same math will make you, and the same math will not make you, isn't it? So be careful the things you say. Don't go and make sweet promises. And people say, yeah, yeah. And I will do this, yeah, yeah. And I will do that. Then when it comes to the work itself, then trouble don't come. So that is why you see it's not everybody that you can fool with sweet promises. Eh? Somebody coming here, you are writing exams when on the third. Nine. Well, I thought you was on the third. Oh, I wish it was on the third. Uh, because the questions are ready. We are just waiting for you to pass. But I know you will not fail. Will you fail? No. Ah, I believe you people now. Eh? So please be guided on what you say. It is not everybody that you can fool. Now, even those in the village, they are smart now. Because they also know what is going on. So if you think that those people, they don't know anything. So you just say things anyhow. Decide what? Fear delegates. You will tell them they will be laughing and doing the during the uh, recently uh, the MPP something primaries. Some were wearing double t shirt isn't it? They want one candidate to hold under and another one on top. So you would think you are fooling them, but you end up what being fooled. Eh? So always your manifesto should be on the truth. See, don't use cunning ways to get to the truth. The same way you got there, that is how you live quickly. So say what you can do. The one that you cannot do, God will do that one for you, isn't it? So don't think that you can always lie and get away with it. No, in future, it will affect you. And people will know you are a liar boy or you are a liar girl and they will not vote for you. Any more questions? Today you didn't talk with zero zero, so I'll give everybody zero zero. You didn't yeah, sorry. You are okay. You are ready for the exam. Yes, we are starting exam tomorrow. Some people said they are ready for the exam. It's them, not you. So you are on your own. You are ready for your exam. Any more questions? Please, from the beginning. So, day of this mature student class, the English language class, if there has been any challenge that you face or you are still facing, kindly let it out. We'll discuss it as family and see how best we can help each other so that we all pass this exams. I want to see all of you in level 100 of Unimat. Be it IFT, IL, or IJ. So please, if you don't say it, we cannot help you. It's just like you are sick, you go to the hospital. If you don't say what your problem is, the doctor cannot prescribe any medication for you. So feel free, ask any question. The ones that I cannot answer, you answer them yourselves here, and then we move. We are starting for us. 
or somebody want to advise us. Look, let me advise you with the first advice. In the essence, don't try to copy. This is a university. It's not a that will be passing papers around university. You do that, they sack you from the exam floor, and that is the end. You are not coming back. So all the time you spent here, the uh, uh, the books you have read, the download, the data you have bought, it is all in what in vain. So learn, study, make sure you know that. Don't even ask your friend for calculator. Some people, even in English exam, they still use calculators. <laughs> When they are sweating, then they will start asking. They say, what, are, what were you telling him? I was asking for calculator. Do you use calculator in English class? So you come to the exam hall prepared. No copy. Don't, you know, envisage that, oh, this person is going to teach me. No, we don't allow that in the university. We throw you out as right. So, and you cannot come back after some years before. If you realize you have changed before, or we are convinced that by this number of years, maybe seven, ten years later, and then we realize you have changed before you come back. Eh? So please, do individual what? Study. You can do your group discussion, but in the exam, the paper is for you. They didn't give your friends questions to you. They gave yours to you, so don't copy. The assignment, I realized there were triplets in the class. They have the same answer. Eh? Some are even four. The four, how do they call them? Quadruplet. Some are even seven. They have the same answer. Hey. Yes, even if you are to explain something, the same word to word explanation. Please, for the English exams, are there some things we are supposed to bring or the university is providing us with uh, what we need for the exams? Provide you the answer booklets and then the question papers. That's all. Provide yourself or arm yourself with your pencil and your pen and your erasers in case you want to jot something down. That is all. We are not giving you food. We are not giving you water. We are not giving you anything. Okay? All right. Ask questions so because your questions are very uh, are you writing all the four papers on the night or two on Saturday and two on Sunday? Well, the chief examination officer would, uh, that will be communicated to you, okay? And uh, how the timetable, the examination timetable will be shared ahead of time so you know when you are writing what, okay? Uh -huh. So I'm sure Dr. Semako is working on it or is already ready. And then he may be sharing it anytime soon. Good morning. Um, please, is it possible to know the format of the examination? Would it be like session A and session B? Or... All right. On that note, I was keeping that one for the last, but I will invite my colleague here, clap for him. So he will talk about the format or the nature of the. English language paper. Uh, be reminded that it is not the same as mass or French. This is for English. So don't go and say that, oh, this is what they said they are going to. Eh? Okay. Hello, good morning. My name is Roland. Not Roland Walker. I'm Roland Adams. Okay, so um, I'll talk about the format very, very briefly. Just note that the idea is not to fail you. So it's not going to be very, very difficult. Or perhaps we should make it very difficult. But I realize you're a very smart student, so I'm thinking of uh, tightening it a bit, making it a bit difficult for you. Mm. Someone j just gave me the thumbs up. Like, yeah. So I think I'll do that. But basically, it's something that you can all deal with. We aren't bringing something you've not done in class. So how do you revise? Just go by what you've done in class. That's all. That's all. I'll bring them. I'll talk about it. Yes. Um, some, as soon as I said, oh, just go by what you've done in class, some of you said, hmm. As it reminds me of you of the 
math teachers. The math teacher tells you, uh, oh, it's going to be very easy. So it's going to be in this format. You have objectives. A number of questions. I can't give the exact number, but then you have a number of questions that you answer at the objectives uh, part. And you can manage it. And then you have comprehension. Then there'll be a part where you would have to write something, whether it's a formal letter, whether it's a, a manifesto, story, but we'll decide. But you definitely need to write something. The idea is to judge whether you can be able to express yourself well on paper. If you can put your thought on paper for someone else to read and understand. If it cannot be coherent, then you can't gain admission. You get me? The idea is whether you can put your ideas in an organized manner on paper. That's all we want. We understand that you've not been in school for a long time, at least some of you. And so writing, it's a bit of a challenge. We understand all these things, but we just want to see whether at least you can put your ideas on paper. That's what we want. So please, no need to be afraid. Come in confidently and put in your very best, and I'm sure you'll be fine. Thank you. Only those who did not study or revise that will come and they, they will be shaking like this. And even if the AC is on, you see them sweating. Eh? So please, uh, for example, your formal letters, uh, your point that you make or whatever you are writing about, at least um, uh, your point should not be less than three. Okay. Are you getting my point? Yeah. If you are writing about something, you have to, let's say, uh, I cannot tell you exactly what you write about, but your point that you'll be making in your letters should not be less than three. If you raise only uh, concrete one point, it means your mark will be down, 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 down. Eh? So at least not less than three. So from the beginning, week one, we talk about synonyms, isn't it? We talk about synonyms. What did we say synonyms are? Synonyms. Yeah. Your nearest in meaning. Where is that? Yeah. Where is that? And yeah. Not just nearest in meaning. Eh? Yes. And we gave some examples of what? Synonyms. Then we talk about antonyms, isn't it? And we say antonyms are what? Where is that? Type of, uh, opposite. Opposite in meaning. Then we talk about idiomatic expressions or idioms, other say idioms. We talk about them and then they are meaning, isn't it? So when you see them in sentences, you should be able to interpret them, right? And from there, we talk about comprehension. We discuss. But the comprehension, we even took two weeks or three weeks to discuss it. So it means you are missing the videos are there. Go back and watch them, okay? And we talk about techniques of what? Reading. We talk about what? Scheming, scanning, uh -huh. intensive reading, and then extensive reading. So you apply all those techniques when you are answering or reading the text to answer questions on them. You have to read, understand, go to the question, Go through the question, try to get what they are asking for, then you go back to the passage again, and then you read it. Take your time. Some people are fond of writing. They copy the passage, a point. Even when the answer is at the end, they will copy from the beginning. You see, those are the people that deceive you that they are writing. And then once you are thinking, I what will I write? The person is seriously eh, writing something for, you know, the person is recopying the questions. <laughs> So please be focused. The paper is for you. It's in front of you. Don't look at what somebody is writing. More paper. You don't know what the person has written and calling for more paper. So be serious. We take your time. The problem, your problem is comprehension. And so take your time and read. And we are not going to give you a passage that is so difficult that you cannot understand another question. Is that okay? As for letters, I'm expecting you to blow the letters. Because you write love letters, 
you write uh, application letters, eh? you write application for loan at the banks, you write the letters, you know, the format and the features of those letters. So I'm expecting everybody to pass. As for the objective, it is what? Cha cha, twin, twin, twin. If you don't know, you go and do twin, twin, twin to end you at twin. <laughs> so read, take your time and read the sentence, read the question, understand what they are looking for and provide it. And we don't have a problem. Yes. What if in the question, they say we should write a story? And God being so good, the passage I've been given is a story. <laughs> I decide to repeat that. The passage that was given is a story. Is it not tantamount to copying? <laughs> eh? The passage that you are giving. Sorry? You use synonyms and antonyms and create your own story. Perfect. Just create your own story, but make sure you have all the features, the characters, the setting, the plot, the theme, and then what? The conflict. And make sure it has the correct format, the beginning, the middle, and the end. That is all. We have imaginary stories. You can create your own stories and write about them. Okay? All right. Any other question or suggestion? If there is none, that, yes. Yes. Conflict. No, I told you that it is not every story that has conflict in it. And for example, the perfect tweet that we read, was there any conflict in that story? So sometimes you see the conflict in it, sometimes you don't. Okay. All right, any other question? Of course, we are not going to be that wicked to give you straight question, compose with, and that's all. You have options as to which one you want to write about. Is that okay? Even if you are not giving options, you know everything already. Abby? Eh? Any other question? Yes. Can you hear him? Oh. Yes, every story must has what? A title. So you write the title, underline it, and then you write your story. Is that okay? Any more question? In the absence of any other question? Can you stand up? So today is her birthday. We are going to sing happy birthday to her. You see the way she's looking? So class, ready, go. Happy birthday. Who's birthday? Happy birthday to you. Madam Sideta. The classroom is big, Papa. And they take the camera on just this part so you can see just this one. Small one here. That's a fair. On no fair. What are you using? Ah. Uh, so, on behalf of the class, I want uh, my lady to bless her on her. Um, please, let's pray. Our dear and heavenly father, we thank you for the life of our dear sister. Hey, we this girl here, yeah, every day. It's her birthday. You lay your wonderful hands upon her. Whatever situation she is in, may you change the situation, because today is her day. Let her be happy in her life. Protect her family and protect each and every one also praying for her here. We thank you for all that you've been doing, because you have done so many and wonderful things for us. It's good that we are here today as sisters and brothers. And we pray that whatever we have come here to learn, 
May you help us also accomplish our mission. We pray that nobody fails this exam because we've been struggling for long. And this is our year and this is our time. We know you are the God that never disappoints. You are everlasting Father. You love us. That is why today we are all together here. And therefore, we thank you and we really appreciate it because it's not everyone that has gotten the opportunity like we have done today. We thank you for everything. We also pray that as we finish our class and go back to our various homes, you protect us and guide us. Let your everlasting love continue to be with us. Amen. Amen. So you are hot, yeah? Eh? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. And it's been wonderful. I had a wonderful time with all of you. Even though I don't remember some names, but I remember the faces. And I know that when you see the question paper, you remember what I say about it. And then you will prove everybody that, you prove to everybody that you have really attended the class. Yes. We are on behalf of... <laughs> This is the Director General. Yeah. So on behalf of uh, Mr. Roland and myself, we want to wish you the very best in your revision week through to your exams. Do your best and pass because it's not a difficult paper. Okay? God bless all of you and bye-bye. <laughs>